Okay, this is ARC116. I'm so tired right now for some reason, but let's just get right into it. <laughs> Problem A. Given a positive integer n, or to know more of positive odd divisors of n or positive even divisors of n, given t test cases of each of them. Um. Well, it depends on how many times they can divide n by, right? Two, three, six has the same number. Okay, yeah. If there's zero twos, then it's odd. If there's one two, it's the same. Otherwise, there's more. So we can do t and then one n equals one. That's one. And count in a while. It's um odd. If there's one, they're the same. Otherwise, even. Same odd even. Let's look at problem B. So you're given a sequence of n integers, 2 to the n minus 1 non-empty subsequence of the B of A. B of A. Okay. <laughs> Find the sum of max B times min B over all of them. Okay, let's count how many times, right? Okay. So,
sum of max b times min b. So if we have a times b and then we add s d times e, we can just add a plus c and then multiply that by b. Um, we should probably iterate over, like for each position, first things first, we can sort this array because we're just looking over every subsequence. And then that should make it easier to um, fix the maximum pretty much. So in other words, if we want index i to be the maximum of a certain subset, it just simply has to be the rightmost chosen value. And then we just iterate over all possible minimums. Yeah. Um, how do we do this then? All right, so we sorted the array. And then for a value that's one away, um, number of subsets that exist is just turning that value one. And then it's like turning that value one times a certain times like two to the power of this. Okay, so we can keep like. So this is our answer, and then we keep like along like a prefix like value. Um, and then obviously, number of ways to get it to max is just. I mean, there's just one way, right? Um, yeah, and then we just multiply it by itself, and then we can count it separately, so it's like, If a subset only contains value i, <coughs> otherwise, um, we want to consider everything to strictly left of it. So we can say, so we consider when i is greater than zero. In other words, when there exists elements in the first place. Um. There should be, yeah, so we can do so then we add prefix. Well, I guess we multiply prefix by two first because we shift everything first and then yeah, and then we can do right or not. See if we get it right, first of all. Okay, we got B. Um, let's see. Because C and D have the same point value, I'm gonna check to see which has more solves. Okay, C has more solves. So I'll just do that one first. Just given n and m. Ooh, we're also given a mod. So So 
something like that. How many sequences A of n inverse satisfy the following conditions, such that all values are at least 1 and the most m, and a i plus 1 is a multiple of ai. I see. Well, n is, or m is small enough to where we can factor it. That might be important. So it's like, for position at dp at i, the number of ways to, if, if we have something like dp at iv, where it's like, how many ways do we want to build um, like a prefix of i in the ith value of v? This like leads into a transition of this and then like any like u such that um u is divisible by v. this value doesn't exceed m. Okay, so obviously if you multiply by 1, that's a valid multiple of itself. Um, if we multiply it by like any other larger number, so like even if we multiply by 2 every time, which is like the smallest like actual divisor, um, in about how many operations would it take for this to explode? It would take about like sixteen? Or well, seventeen. Yeah, it would only use at most like seventeen or eighteen moves. So obviously if n is like less than that, then we can just do that. Otherwise um we can pretty much count how many ways exist and then insert the rest of these values as like repeated values pretty much so if we did like twos and then threes um So if we do like a small a dp for like really small n, how do we keep track of that value? I mean, we would only care about how many distinct values existed, right? Yeah. Okay. I think this will work. So we, we first like do a test case where n is like fairly small. N equals n is less than twenty will probably be fine. Yeah, because then you're gonna multiply by two to by like at least two to the nineteen, and that's easily gonna exceed it. Um Yeah, we can just count it directly. Otherwise we do a DP where we count only um those values. So, okay, as for here, if we go down here, we want to count how many ways exist 
to use n numbers, use that many times, and you're going to have at most, out of these n numbers, you're going to be at most distinct. So it's 18 squared times m memory. How will that, is that okay? That's 64 million. Um, 64 million. Honestly, that, that's probably going to be fine because they give so much memory in App Coder. I mean, if it's not, we can like optimize it anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I'll go with it. First, let me do this DP first. Where it's like you're on the nth value and you're starting with value m. Well, n plus 1, I guess. the first value is equal to i, and there's exactly one way to do this. I guess we only care about every multiple, right? So it's like d is equal to um, v, d plus n equal to m, and then d plus equal to v. It's probably better, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lot better. Um, how do we do this then? We can do dp at i d add i minus 1 to d. than 20, so I'll just test it first. We'll have n less than 20. That's not right. Um, that's okay. V, D equals V. Um, Oh, I'm dumb. It starts at 1, that's why. 3, 4, should be 13. Yep, okay. Um, the rest of these have, okay, no, the rest of the samples actually have something larger, that's fine. Because now we want to count um, for each value. ways are there to end at m or m plus one and we have at most like some number of distinct values to begin with so i believe it's nine well i mean we don't have to be exact about it we can just say like 20 for example 
because like 2 to the power of 19 will definitely exceed it. I'll just say 9. I'll just say 20. What is 19? If there's 19 distinct values, exist. Okay, and so dp at so we first start off with this is the first value that you start with and this is exactly one distinct value that you've processed so far. So it's four and well okay. This is the term. Term is less than one key. similar dp up here except we also keep track of them um, we also want to keep track of this 21 thing yeah so we do something like this long nux is equal to um, that value plus one because we've increased the number of distinct values by one plus the value at dp at v a and then over here we can just do the case for it that existed um, So this is a number of ways to, for the first, okay, this is a number of ways to have, like, d distinct elements, and then the rest of the elements have to, like, they already exist. So, we have, like, n left over is n minus d, and that's guaranteed to be positive, because n is strictly greater than 20. And then we can say, um, It's like some for each leftover value. It's we have d choices to choose from. So we need power. Um, we 
Yeah, that would make sense. So we have D choices to choose from. Um, Sometimes we have to choose out of D values and we have to choose um, leftover number of times. C++ for this. Oh, okay. It didn't even give the right value. So we probably want to debug it first. that you start with. I mean, it did give the right value for Selwyn 116 or whatever it is. and those 20 values to be distinct. Yeah, because only 20 values can be distinct in the first place. If you do like 1, then 2, then 4, at some point this is going to be too big. I mean, you only do this at most 20 times. So it's 20 times, oh, I guess there's another, there's a log factor though, mm, that's true, there is a log factor, okay, I want to, okay, I think here's what I'll do, I'm going to debug this, figure out what's, why this is wrong, and once I figure that out, I'm going to convert to C++. Gives the correct value for this. <laughs> and that's just kind of weird. N plus one. Um, yeah, base case is that. Yeah, that's fine. We start it. So the next chosen value is equal to this, comes from this. And obviously, you don't add any distinct numbers. Otherwise, in this case, we do add a distinct number. <laughs> and we make sure... Oh, shoot, I know why. I know, I know exactly why. Um, and then if... This should fix it. It just takes way too long. Um, is there any way to optimize this? Not, I don't really see an immediate way to do that. Let's, let me think. What if we did something like this. Still running. Oh, it gave the same value. Wait, hold on. That doesn't seem right. Oh wait, 
Okay, yeah, because that many don't, don't exist in the first place. Okay, so if it's greater than 20, what is the maximum number of distinct elements we can have? 2 to the power of 0 all the way to 2 to the power of 18. Well, 18 is too big. 2 to the power of 17 will fit, though. So if it's like 2 to the power of 17... Then there's 18 distinct numbers. So, you know, if you do k, you do k terms, this is k plus 1, k plus 1. Okay, I think this will like slightly help. I mean, I don't think it'll help enough, but it should be a decent amount. Oh wait, hold on. Line 61. Oh. If A is less than K. It gave a different value this time. That's odd. Um, yeah, that's really odd. Are we sure it's this? Are we sure? Um, yeah, because we only care about the we do care about the multi-set, we also care about for each number how many times it exists. Okay, does it still work for this sample? It does. So it gave 985 stuff if k was equal to 20. Let me just double check that. But if it was at most... That many number of values? Let's see. Yeah, it just gives a different value. That's really weird. Kinda weird, dude. Yeah, we just want to look at every multiple. Um, are we sure it's a mod? If we choose... Oh, wait, hold on. It's B to the... Wait, no, that's all right. That's fine. Do we check N and M? DP, this is pretty straightforward. Um... Value. 
you care about what value it ended in and also how many distinct values occurred. Yeah. Okay. So, number of ways that it starts with this value, and there's exactly one. So this is the number of distinct values, and for each of the leftover numbers that we haven't... Did oh wait, I'm so dumb. Okay, I know. This is n minus, um, n minus k. I think that's it. How did it even pass the 2030 case then? That's odd. That would also explain why um, it would be different for that, because it would be subtracting more leftover values, maybe? Yeah, I don't like how long this is taking to run every time. I'll definitely just convert this equals plus, first thing I get. Um, first can that I get. What if we do 18? Because you know every time there's going to be at most 18 distinct numbers. But first let's check the 2030 test case. That's still correct. Number of ways it ends in this value with d distinct integers in it. Um, we add all those ways together. The leftover number of ways to do it is equal to that. Oh, it's still weird. Why isn't it working? Oh, wait, is it n minus? It. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it n minus d or n minus k? We used the k distinct integers. So, yeah, this is a number of ways to use k integers, and this and d of them are distinct. Yeah, so it is supposed to be n minus k. Okay. sequence A of n integers satisfy the following conditions. Okay, that's not right. It shouldn't, the value shouldn't be changing just because it increases upper bound. Um, T, we do K minus, we do this many turns, yeah. dependent on dp alone and then dp gets set to next leftover is equal to n minus k numbers and then it's like out of these leftover numbers that haven't been assigned yet we have d choices for them Res is greater than that. 
plus or equal to p plus 1, I guess. That's going to, yeah. Because otherwise, those states are just going to be some, they just don't, they won't make any sense. is because um, everything is just going to be zero otherwise. So like B and then A, D, A plus 1 to D to A. So A plus I is divisible, right? Or like it's a multiple. Yeah. This, does this loop over all multiples? It does. Mm -hmm. Because then 2 times v, 3 times v, 4 times v, so on. And dpd comes next. I'm not really sure what's wrong with this. Because we start off this way, that's fine. Um, And then we do this, do this, do this. Are we sure the, this mod value is correct? 9982443533. That looks fine. turns and then I guess it is this value is um be equal to, um, we transition this many times, we, yeah, because k numbers already exist in the first place. Out of those k numbers, d of them are distinct. So left over it is n minus k. And then for each of these, like, unused values, we just want to assign them to one of these d choices. So if it's something like we started like this, or like two, three, three, three. If you assigned both of them to two, we would have that many twos. We have assigned both one to two, one to one. Necessarily, the order that we choose them in don't doesn't matter. I th that's probably why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because if we do a value 
if we like first add into a two and then we add into a three, there's gonna be two twos and two threes. But if we then add into a three and then add into a two, it's also it's gonna be different. So how do we account for that? Oh, it's just stars and bars. Yeah, it's just stars and bars. Um stars and bars. This is a number of stars that occur, number of bars that occur. So we do factorial this way. Instead of doing this, we have n minus. Okay, we have leftover number of things, and okay, we have this many stars. How many bars do we have? Um, this is d minus one, I think. why it was still correct for 2030s because you're only adding you can only add like one extra value so it wasn't so it didn't have any room to double count obviously a little slow but <clears throat> C++ could fix that <coughs> I'll just look at D for now and then come back to this because it's still like giving a right answer for that and I don't know why it's like it just doesn't make any sense so given our integers n and m how many sequences how many sequences a of n integers satisfy the following conditions So n and m are most of this. How many sequences a of n integers satisfy the following conditions? This happens, this happens. And then the zor is zero. Okay, and the sum has to be m. I see. So 
so we could easily do um, an n cubed dp, where n cubed would be like npi sums or, where it's like, how many ways can we achieve, um, how many ways can we achieve a state where we, where our current sum is equal to this and our current zor is equal to this? And we used um, i out of n elements. So that's like, that's n cubed, but, or I guess n times m times m, which is too slow. How do we optimize this to n squared? Well, okay. I think it's, given how the zor is zero, or I mean, it has to be zero, um, this means that every bit should appear at most, oh, well, every bit appears an even number of times out of everything. And so in order for the zor to be zero, m has to be even. 10 to 5 is zero, yeah. And so m has to be, um, a result of like all the carryover values. Um, so how do we determine carryover? Okay, so what if we build, so like for each bit, maybe we could say, how many different ways can we assign this value to this one. Yeah, so like for each bit we can say, we obviously we have to assign it an even number of times. And so for each bit, how many ways can we choose, how many ways can we assign the bits basically such that we get the sum of that. So we always maintain, so we maintain the fact that Zor is always zero and we kind of build all n elements at once, bit by bit. So then instead, we would only have to keep track of dp at sum. And then for each, yeah, and then for each bit position, we only count obviously how many ways are there to assign that bit in the first place, and then what that sum is. So, Obviously, if a sum exceeds m, then it's not good. Otherwise, it should be fine. Okay, this I, this should work. Static final mod is equal to this. What do we do? Long m plus one. Okay, and they can be at least zero. That's important. Okay, so the number of ways to achieve a sum of zero is obviously just one. Okay, and so then we do um, B bits. The most significant bit Well, okay, 2 to the power of 10 is about 1,000. So 2 to the power of 12 is 4,000. We don't want to go past 2 to the power of 12. So we start at this bit and we go to at most 13. Okay, so we do this DP. And then for each um, set of bits, I guess, we do 4 and on is the number of bits that are on. On is, we know this at most n, and we only want to consider even number of occurrences. Because that's the only way that sort can be maintained as zero. And so we can actually just copy what we did over here. Except instead it's only um, 6,000. So 
replace this. And then we obviously want to get everything in here. Okay. 6,001, 6,001. Boom, boom. Less than 6,000. Yeah, that looks fine. And then we do twos. So out of A, we, so out of A ways to do it, we want to pick out B different values. And we don't care about the order in which they're chosen in. So that, this should be fine. Yeah. How much that is being increased by? It's by zero. So four is s is equal. I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter. Hold on. So for on is equal to zero, on is less than or equal to n, on plus equal to two. previous sum. If m plus increase is strictly greater than m, then we just stop this dp. Otherwise, we could then do dp of, well, next. m plus import, m plus this, plus equal to um, dp of m times the times the number of ways we can choose out of n numbers, we choose all of them to be on. Zero. Um, whatever this is should be that. Okay, let's submit. Um, let's judging. This is thirteen times n times n. That should be fine in terms of runtime. And it's like a good constant factor because we break this loop most of the time. Okay, we got it. Um, now we need to figure out what's wrong with C. Yeah, D was really easy. Like honestly, like easier than D. But I'm not, okay, so C is like, Um, <sighs> okay, what if we do like 25 and 30, for, for example, for C, what would this give? This would give six one one nine two two zero. Um. What about for this DP? Okay, it gives a completely different value. One five three one seven six. 
Okay, so our DP is just kind of off in here, probably. Yeah, because I definitely trust this DP more. Because it's a lot more straightforward. What could we, what could we be double counting here? ways to get this value. Um, another number of ways to get that value. be more interesting is um if debug and um d is equal to one we print ten and we also print sum so for the twenty five and thirty case. Yeah, that, that makes sense, actually. What about d is equal to 2? It's this. 10,206. Twenty. 
Okay, so we're like blatantly overcounting. I wonder if this is divisible. 1895 over 3 to 20. It is not. That is okay. Blatant overcounting is happening. Okay, I need to go to the back. Alright, I'm back and I realized what I need to fix for this. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Um, let's see, k distinct numbers, false. I'm just gonna delete everything in here, cause I know, cause I know like what to fix. So it's not that big of a deal. And plus one. Erase and fill the at one. And then four. This is number distinct elements. K is less than. equal to 2k is less than or I guess how many turns we use right k equals 1 yeah the new long n plus 1 we only need 4 and so for each old value that existed We want to count this, and then next. <coughs> so next at d, well, okay. If dp of d is strictly greater than zero, then we can do this. And then next at d plus equal to dp of v. We subtract mod from here, and then. Um, dp becomes next, and then 4 and b is equal to 1, b is less than n, b is plus, sums of, sums of v add on dp of v, no, sums of k, my bad. And then we use stars and bars. So for int This is a number of distinct elements that we use. So int leftover is equal to n minus k. Um and then long temp is equal to sums at k times count. Should this be a lot faster? <laughs> Never mind. Apparent. Apparently not. Um, if n is less than this, otherwise it's like this. I'm dumb. I'm dumb. D plus equal to V. Um, okay, that's correct. Let's see how fast this test case runs. Nice! And it's correct. Okay. That's good. That's good, that's good. That's very good. Alright. Submit it. We have 40 minutes left. Let's see if this is right, first of all. Okay, we got it. How are, how are our standings? 
Also, E doesn't actually seem too difficult. So, that's interesting. Or at least, like, it has a decent number of solves. Okay, we are 470th. That's honestly hoping for slightly better, but, I mean, at the same time, we had a kind of bad penalty, so it's fine. Alright, problem E. A kingdom has n towns, 1 through n, there's n minus. Okay, so it's a tree. Yeah, it's just an undirected tree. Um, we want to spread some information over all the kingdoms. Since he is busy, he can directly transmit this information to at most k towns, which is strictly less than n. Is a king located anywhere? Or... No, not really. Wants to spread some information all over the kingdom. Okay, so directly, and then assume that. And for each here, towns A connected by a road. If A has already received information at time this, but B has not, then B receives it at time T. So. Oh, okay. So it's just like a BFS type of thing. Wants to choose the k towns that transmit the information to minimize the time taken until every town receives it. Can we potentially binary search? So we essentially want to choose k towns such that if we do a multi-source BFS, the distance is, the maximum like distance is minimized. Um. Okay. So ARC one sixteen E. I let's just use fast scanner to stay safe. Two hundred thousand. That's fine. So how do we do this if it's an array? If we root the tree anywhere, then obviously we care about where we put the subtrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
and kingdoms and towns. F is, okay, F is like kind of hard. Even though they both, they're both 800 points. That's really weird. That is really weird. Um, okay. So we definitely just think about E. <clears throat> okay, so because it's a tree, if we just root the tree anywhere, um, assigning a K, I see, um, we might be, bi maybe we could binary search it, where we binary search on the answer, and then for each iteration, um, we like, take a leaf, or not a leaf, we take a, um, yeah, like somewhere in a rooted tree, um, we care about the height. And so we put, we want to find the farthest, yeah, we want to find the farthest leaf, and then go up enough parents to where the distance is K, and we like kind of put it on there. And then we just kind of, and we do like a BFS, where every time we get K more than, well, every time we're about to get more than K away from a chosen node, we choose another node at that spot. Is that correct? I think so. Wait, is it? No, it's not. Because we can just put a node on the other on the other end. True. Okay. Um If we wanted to solve this problem on an array, then it's just like math, pretty much. Yeah, because if we have n nodes in a line, we can just get every block of like 2 times k or 2 times k minus 1 and just put it in the middle. Mm -hmm. and then we get a binary search on that.
So for a value that we can put it on the tree by, let's say we just have we have um an arbitrary tree. Looks like this. What if we turn the tree into a line? So the diameter of this tree is this one, two, three, four, five nodes. And then over here we have this, this, and yeah, that's it. Can we just ignore that? Um, there's 20 nodes. The diameter is this value. Okay, well, I mean, if it's a line, then it's obvious. If it's a 5, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 5, 4. So it's like 1 connects to 3, 4. And then a 5 connects to 4. So the diameter is 1, 4, 5. And then like the... No, the diameter is 2, 1, 4, 5. Yeah. And then out of a 1, a 3 exists. might be I think this might be correct let's try it I want to try it so we want to find the diameter of the tree so how do we do that do from one and this is equal to gen yeah it's equal to BFS. We start from, well, I guess from node 0 technically. So BFS from node 0 and there's total of n nodes. Public static void. Well, no.
to the minimum time. Yeah. So k is strictly less than n, so we know it's going to take at least one. And it could take up to up to n, I guess, right? Yeah, up to n. So up to n because each time step you're going to come across at least one new node. Yeah. Is that is that how it works? Yeah, that, that should be right. And then we just print Minus one is always possible, yeah. So this is true. Well, okay. Okay, so if it's like really, yeah, otherwise we do this, where if res is less than or equal to k, then we want to increase the frequency of this. Okay, line 30, what's going on? be at least two, right? No, it can also be one. Oh, wait, no, yeah, 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 it has to be at least two. That's really weird. Hold on. Our BFS, maybe? No, is distance at next is equal to zero? Oh my god, I'm so dumb. Do that hole. when it's supposed to be 1, but it should have been 1 anyway. Well, okay. Yeah, we need to calculate this a little bit better. Okay, well first let's print out the diameter for everything. So diameter of this should be 5, diameter of this should be 4. Okay. And then... What we do is, um, 
what do we do then? Why don't we just find a way to space this out evenly? Um, and the question is, why does one not work? We can put... Two away, this is almost two away. One, two, three, four, five. Or we could do here on one, two, three. So I is equal to mid. a diameter of four. Okay, that's definitely not right though. Yeah. How do we fix this? Yeah, we potentially need to add one. is strictly driven in the mid, then we have to add one more. Because like this distance over here is two, which is strictly greater than one. Then we add one. Two. One. Two. Okay. Two, one, and two. Is it possible with this diameter? Eleven. Eleven and two. K is, what is k equal to? k is equal to 3. So if we colored this spot, and then we colored this spot, that is a valid way to, no, then we have to color the spot as well over here. It's obvious that that doesn't really necessarily work. Um, yeah, because if it's like over here at a certain distance, then we have to account for that as well. So for each position in here, we want to figure out where that is.
regenerate distances. Or not distances, but parents. Um, and we can root the subtree here, find the farthest one. This doesn't. <clears throat> yeah, we would need to generate subtree sizes. <clears throat> so, like, once we have the tree, there's like a subtree extending from the line. And then with that line, extend by at most the distance from here. So we have a range that we put these values in. So it's either going to be this many or this many plus one. And depending on where the plus one is, it could be a little different. <coughs> Okay, so rooted at one, or I guess if you find the deepest leaf, <coughs> we can figure out where in this line we have to put our node. So if it's like extending by this much, we always have to put a node um, at the root. <clears throat> if it's goes, if it goes up by too much. So this reduces to having like some number of ranges. And we want to choose a minimum number of points such that every range contains at least one of these points. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have enough time to implement this, but I think this is, actually, is this right? It's hard to see. Actually, I don't know if that's right or not. Because if you have a line, it might be possible, it might be more optimal to put a node somewhere off of this diameter. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's right or not, because it might be optimal to put one node. But then that would mean... Wait, no, but then that would mean um, you would be lacking space in the actual diameter itself. 
I think this is right. I don't know if I can implement it in four minutes though. Cause I have to do like line sweep. I have to generate subtree sizes. Or well, not sizes, like for each subtree in the diameter. Um I find the farthest leaf that's not in the diameter. And then for each of those like for each of those subtrees, I can create a range and then um, I create the initial ranges, which are just like groups of whatever I'm binary searching on. So in this case, it'd be like mid. And then do like a line sweep, count how many points you would need. I think that's it. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can implement that though in the time that I have. I really don't know. Yeah, because once you remove a range, okay, this is, I'll definitely upsolve this, but yeah, I think I'll just chill for now. Like, I just, I can't really reasonably expect myself to implement this in the amount of time I have. So yeah, that's pretty much my contest. Let's see. How many people have solved E? Okay. I mean, if my if my idea is correct, that would make sense with how many people have solved it. That would definitely make sense. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Do we go over solutions? I'll just go over them like super briefly. Like I only did A through D, but. I feel like, yeah, um, I think all of these problems are actually pr pretty interesting, so that's a good thing. Okay, so starting with problem A, um, basically, um, what, wait, what was problem A asking again? Oh, right, like you're given a, a bunch of like test cases, and for each test case, you want to um, figure out whether that number has more odd or even divisors so the trick is is that um if you obviously like the naive solution would just be to factor every number and then count like how many odd and how many even exist but that's not going to run in time because n is 10 to the 18 and you have to do that for every test case and there's 200,000 test cases so the way that you do this is you realize that for every odd divisor that exists if 2 is a divisor of um, n, then for every odd divisor, there exists an even divisor. So then you realize that if n is divisible by 2, but not 4, so in other words, in this list of factors, it contains 2, you can take every um, odd divisor of n, multiply it by, multiply each odd divisor by 2, and that gives you the entire list of divisors. So then, it's just like a little bit of casework. <clears throat> you count um, how many times two appears in n, and then if two appears zero times, so if n is an odd number, then obviously there's no even divisors, so then it's odd. If n appears, well, if two appears exactly once, then by the logic I just mentioned, um, the number of odd divisors equals the number of even divisors, so then they're the same. And then if n is divisible by four, or like some larger power of two, then you can take all of those divisors and then multiply them by two again. So that means that there's more even than odd. So that's how you do A. Um, problem B. Okay, problem B was you want to consider every non-empty subset of an array and you want to, and then for each subset, you want to multiply the maximum by the minimum value. And so the question is, asking, um, you want to find the sum of all of these values over every non-empty subset of in this array. So the trick is, is that if you sort this array first, then you can pretty much iterate over the maximum value that's chosen, and the minimum value is guaranteed to be to the left of it. And so that makes it really easy to keep track of 
um, like all the possible values. So pretty much um, over here, i is um, basically means the index of the maximum number that I'm currently considering. And I also maintain a prefix. So this prefix, <coughs> this prefix um, keeps track of the sum of all like the possible minimum values considering um, with multiplicity considered. And the way that you consider for like all the possible subsets is you just multiply a prefix by two and then add this value in every time you're done, every time you want to move on to the next like index. So <clears throat> yeah, this is, I think this is like a relatively standard trick, but it's also like pretty neat. So yeah, that's problem B. Problem C. What was problem C? Oh, right. Okay. So problem C is you have to count how many arrays exist such that the, such that none of them, such that all of these elements are at least one and at most M. And um, if you consider consecutive elements, the next element is always divisible by the current element. So in other words, A at index I plus one is always divisible by A at I. And you want to count how many arrays exist. So the trick is, is that you could consider doing like a few different things. If you um, set a at index i plus one to be equal to a at i, then they're obviously just going to be the same value. Otherwise, um, the next value has to be at least two times a at i, because that's the um, smallest multiple that's not equal to itself. And then you realize that if you keep on doing like these multiples on top of each other, um, you're eventually going to exceed m really quickly, because if you because 2 to the power of, um, I think 2 to the power of 19 is already 500,000. So if you do, um, if you do like 18 steps that um, aren't this trivial case where you just use the same number over again, that means that you're going to exceed m. So we can actually do this dp. So if n is a small number, then we do like a naive dp, which is pretty obvious. It's simply just, um, consider counting how many ways we can choose some prefix of n elements such that the last element is m. And so that's only if n is small. Otherwise, if n is large, we can um, assume that k distinct numbers exist. And then we want to first count how many ways we can choose k numbers, or I guess like a prefix of length k of a given array, such that um, all of these numbers are distinct. And so given, and then with this information, you can then determine um, how many total ways there are to exist. Because let's say um, n was equal to like 20, but you know that there's only three distinct values in the first place. Then that means that those 17 numbers have to be assigned to one of those three numbers. And so if you think of them as like three different buckets, you want to put those 17 numbers into these different buckets, and you want to count how many ways you can arrange these numbers distinctly. And so um, this is actually a concept called stars and bars. And it's like, <clears throat> pretty much you have, um, if you want to, if you have n items, like n identical items, and you want to put them in like k boxes, the number of ways to do that is, um, m plus k minus 1 choose k minus 1. So yeah, that's like, that's a pretty like standard combo, like combo formula. And that's where this comes from. And obviously, um, you want to like generate factorials and inverse factorials quickly, like this, just use like fast exponentiation and you're good. So yeah, that's C. All right, the last problem I solved is problem D. I thought problem D was like really easy, honestly. Definitely easier than C. Maybe even easier than B. I don't know. I, I, I just didn't find it that difficult. But pretty much, the gist is, is that, um, uh, what was it? Oh, right. <clears throat> so you're also given two integers, n and m. And you want to count how many arrays, how many arrays of size n of non-negative numbers exist such that the sum of all these numbers is equal to m, and the zor of all these numbers is equal to zero. So the first thing to notice is, so you want to think about 
what does it mean for a set of numbers to have a Zor of zero? And you could reword this to say that um, for each like bit position, the number of times a bit is set among all of n numbers has to be an even number of times. Because in the Zor function, bits at different positions don't affect each other, and so you want everything to be zero. And that's the only way that you can make that equal to zero. So that's pretty much the only observation you need. From there, you just do um, a DP where you essentially um, you maintain how many ways you can choose. Um, you maintain like for each, well, you want to first iterate over like these bits, right? And then you want to count how many ways we can choose an even number of bits um, from out of these like n different numbers because the Zor of those will always be zero. And then with that, um, we know that the sum is going to be just like two to the power of the bit that we're considering times the number of bits that are currently turned on. And then it's like um, kind of a knapsack type DP where we just um, use, again, a little bit of combo to figure out um, how many ways we can choose on bits out of n total bits in, in total. And we want to make sure the number of bits that are turned on in each location is always even. So we start from zero and we always increase by two. And so, yeah, we consider um, positions from zero to two to the power of 13, because two to the power of 13 is um, greater than 5,000. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I do this trick where I actually create like a second DP array. So rather than having like um, n times m memory, I have m plus m memory. And this is, and I don't think that um, n times m memory will emily because at coder, memory limits are really generous. But this is just a nice trick to do. So yeah, that's D. Those are all the problems that I did. I'll, I guess I'll talk about my idea for E. So if you consider, well, I mean, I'm not sure if this is right or not, but if you consider the um, tree as a line with like subtrees extending out of it, and this line is like a diameter, then the problem seems to become a little bit easier. So pretty much what you do is there's a property in which if you take a tree, um, I don't know how to draw on my Mac. I guess I'll show it over here. Yeah, actually, just look at this example. So there's a property where if you um, draw the trees like this, like this is, let's assume that that's your initial tree. Um, if you take a diameter and you kind of stretch it out, the tree will look something like that. And one property about this like tree is that um, these subtrees over here, uh, where are they? Right here, like these subtrees, their depth won't exceed the, um, the, um, the prefix or the suffix of the diameter that's associated with it. Because if it is, then that means that the diameter you've chosen isn't the longest diameter. And so it would have just chosen that path along that subtree as a diameter. And so with its property, um, we can kind of consider the diameter as one like segment. And then if we choose a point at the root of a subtree in the diameter, then all of the nodes that are not in the diameter in the subtree will be the, um, at most as far away as the farthest node in the diameter. So what I was thinking is that um, I could create this diameter tree, and then for each subtree, I find the farthest leaf from the diameter. And then I consider this to be like a range. So if the leaf is really far away, then this range is like really strict. I, like um, one of the nodes in the diameter has to be in like a certain range for this tree to um, satisfy a certain distance. And then I like, and then I can essentially create these set of ranges. And I also create ranges out of the diameter itself, where if I'm checking to see if an answer like k is valid or not k, I guess x. If I wanted to check to see if I can make the distance at most x, I have to consider um, ranges in the diameter of size x. Because by pigeonhole principle, 
if I if any of these ranges don't include a node, then it's then this arrangement isn't valid. So then I wanted to um essentially generate these ranges and then do a line sweep um on all of these ranges to count how many points I need. And then if the number of points I need exceeds k, then I want to um increase my answer because then increasing my answer would use less nodes. And if um, the node number of nodes that I use is at most k, then I want to check to see if it's possible to get a better answer. So that's where the binary search was going to come from. But yeah, that's what I was going to do for E. I ran out of time, though, when I like realized that. But also, I'm not really sure if that's right or not. So it's fine if it's not right. Um, if it's not right, I'll put it in the comments. I'll definitely upsolve it like pretty much right after I stop recording. But yeah, that's ARC116. I think this is like, this might be my first time solving four problems in an ARC. So that's kind of cool. I'm not sure though. I have to double check that. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed watching me um, do CF or doing CP while I'm sleep deprived.